Hey guys, welcome back. Chris Bircher. Knowledge plus experience equals wisdom. This is episode 115, continuing on the acid test, but really, you know, focusing on this idea that nature uh, has, has, has given us the models to answer many of the questions that we need to answer today. And uh, I'm, <laughs> the more I do this, the more I discover that there's been a ton of people out there before me uh, that have already had this idea of using nature as an advisor, and there's plenty of people doing this, which I'm, I'm um, excited about. I'm glad that, 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 that this isn't you know, an empty space, if you will. In fact, I just picked up uh, one of the first books that I've heard several people mention, including Nate Hagen's and uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger, uh, E.O. Wilson's Consilience. And this idea of consilience is that you can, there's these patterns that occur, well, specifically what E.O. Wilson was trying to do was talk about patterns between science and the humanities. And, uh, you know, this is something that's really driven me is that you can lift these patterns off off from nature and sort of impose them on contemporary issues that, that humans are dealing with today. Uh, and, the, and, and, and also the idea that there's this convergent evolution idea that these ideas that exist in nature have gone through a serious filtration system of natural selection. They're here because they work. And so if we're looking for things that work, why not just look to the natural world? Now, this is a episode is going to be specifically about what's broken or why we're broken and, and, and the, the upper level systems thinking ideas that I think we need to focus on. I just wrote an article uh, on Medium, which again is behind a paywall, so many of you probably won't read unless you're on there um, as writers yourselves, but I'll post it on my blog, a version of it. And it, the idea is that um, climate change is n- only a symptom. So climate change is not the problem. Climate change is a symptom of a bigger problem. And like most things, we've got to go upstream. I use this metaphor all the time. Again, a stream is organized in such a way that it's very has very low complexity uh, in the high end. It's very small. It's very, I dare use the word, simple. But it has very few parts to the system. As it moves downstream, the complexity increases and there are more and more pieces. And it's you know, when we're looking at something like climate change, we're in the ocean, you know, to use the stream metaphor. And we look for solutions that are slightly upstream, like maybe in the delta where the river comes out or in the mixing zone or, you know, somewhere in the the downstream portion, uh, we look for problems to solve or we look for solutions to the problems. But really, those are those solutions there are also problems <laughs> linked upstream. And if you've seen any of the episodes where I talk about my dissertation work, this is very much sort of the idea of these nested variables being influenced by and influencing one another. And it all points toward a systems thinking model, which is sort of the opposite of reductionism, right? The Enlightenment and the scientific revolution were great at helping us focus, right? To say, oh, the human body is so complex but we're sick and how do we fix it? So we reduced the human body and looked at its parts. Oh, look at what the digestive system does. If this is a pooping problem, it's probably related to the digestive system and not the circulatory system. And we learned so much about each one of these little parts. And we've been on this mission. You know, the pendulum has swung so far toward the reductionist side that all we do is look at the parts and we forget that you know, the, the trees make up a forest or whatever, you know, we've, it's just a simple shift in perspective. And I don't think, I'm not trying to say we don't need to understand the parts. We do. But I think, as I've said before, science has sort of answered what it can, you know, as a, as a singular myopic keyhole focused tool, it's time to put these parts back together (laughs) and look at how they interact. And that's what we need today. And that's the movement that we're going to that's going to win the war against human suffering. And then what is that human suffering? That's really what this episode is about. Uh, And what are the solutions to the problems? And so let's use climate change as as an example, because it's a good one. It's big and it's complex and it's nefarious and it's multifaceted. And, you know, we think switching over from fossil fuels to electric cars is going to solve all the problem. And that's where we're, 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 we're like, we're taking a reductionist approach to the solutions as well, and that's you know not, just not going to work. Um, but we have to think about climate change as a system. What's going on in the system? And in my article, what I talk about is how the real problem is not 
CO2 in the atmosphere. It's not burning fossil fuels that produce the CO2 in the atmosphere. It's not even the shareholders at ExxonMobil or whatever wanting a higher payday, driving cheaper and less environmentally friendly ways of getting the fossil fuels and burning them. You know, it's it's the underlying, what's even further upstream than that? You know, what's even further upstream than money? It's it's why do we value money? Why, what makes it so important? You know, the reason, you know, the 30,000 foot view reason for climate change is because there's a whole lot of humans uh, wanting to do a lot of stuff on the planet. That's about our values. And I like this idea of global values because it's so... It's so nebulous, right? But I really truly think that we need a global value system that sort of supersedes any local level. You know, it's a it's not even global, but you know, in in a communal sense, a species level governance that sort of says no matter what we want to do with respect to our religious beliefs, how we treat women, or you know, whether or not we sacrifice animals. You know, all those little details don't matter. What 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 is going to tr- trump, for lack of a better word, all of those other things? And right now, climate the, the the cause of climate change is a global value system that focuses on monetary wealth, status, and power. Right, that's what got us here. Those global values trumping all else are the problem. And we need to replace those values with something healthier, <laughs> you know, more systems oriented that accounts for all the waste that we those uh, those values will ignore because the pursuit of monetary power, I mean, slavery, right? We've made a lot of decisions in the name of monetary wealth that probably wouldn't disagree with a global value system. And, and think, and I know this is impossible, right? We don't just sit down 8 billion people, poll them, and come to some unanimous decision. I get that. But this, how you get this done or and why it isn't being done and why it changed in the first place is really poor organization, right? So that's a, a, an, a, an upstream problem is that not only have our values changed, we need to go up to those values, but the very system for establishing and enforcing those values has been destroyed. It doesn't exist anymore. And, in the, in the, and it's hard to talk about because on the one hand, there's this utopian world that we could paint that doesn't look anything like the world that we have now. Or we could try to talk about it, understand it, and modify it in the terms of what we have today. And what we have today is a whole lot of people living in really big cities, governed in lots of different ways, and the sort of overlapping of governance with corporate power and religious power. So that sort of muddy, you know, so so that so that it's really hard to tell who's in charge, and it's really hard to get anything done. Um, and so what we need to do is, is one, A, like just throw all those things out and start over. But that's really hard. I, I can hear... You know, the, the type A neo um, economist, neo capitalist economist screaming at me, and sort of the religious theorists and everybody else saying, You can't do that. Well, I don't like that answer. <laughs> you can't put someone on the moon. You can't, you know, dilute all forms of technology into a rectangle that fits in your pocket. Uh, you can't, you know, cure HIV. I mean, come on. That's just not an acceptable answer for humans. We can do a lot of amazing things. We can do this. But sort of the how we do it makes more sense to modify the systems that we have. And a couple of things that we do that we could do better is one, it's really hard to manage billions of people, right? And so we have to split the world up into more manageable numbers. And I think we can look to the indigenous cultures. We can look to the persistence for nearly 300,000 years prior to the Enlightenment and, and, and Industrial Revolution and the Scientific Revolution to how humans live. We can look to those models to inform us. And one of the things they did was they lived in smaller groups. And it's almost a cop-out to say, well, we can't do that anymore because our groups are too big. No, we, we can manage groups. We just have to break them up a little bit better. The idea that we all mostly live in these giant cities, for one, is a problem. That's a resource use problem. It's a concentration problem. It's a pollution problem. It's a management problem. 
we can encourage people to spread out more. It's something we're going to have to do anyway because we just are simply too dense. You know, we could the, the, the density of the planet could be spread a little more thinly. Um, but even if we don't physically change, we can we can alter the way we do governance. You know, by the number of people in a particular group and just nest those groups. It can be done. It has been done. I watched Art Bikem, a, a teacher at Virginia Tech, who's probably emeritus status by now or retired, manage 600 student classes by dividing them up into groups and, re- and creating a small class environment with a large number of people. And he, this guy's won every teaching award Virginia Tech awards. So he, he, he's on to something. But he's also looked at as a kook uh, and all, by a lot of faculty members and a lot of other people. Uh, for the way that he does things, because it's it's outside the box. It's non-traditional. That's the kind of approach we're going to have to take now. A systems approach, right? Of a, a series of interacting and nested parts of which these manageable sized groups of people become a part. We can do that. And that's that's sort of the first upstream step of how, how do we even get towards some consensus uh, of what our global values are. And I suggest that our global values weren't always about money because we didn't have money. And they weren't about status because status had no value. Uh, and they certainly weren't, they, they, you know, the power thing is arguable because, again, this silverback gorilla being the strongest and beating up all the other males so he can, you know, reproduce with all the females, that model sort of persists, right? Well, there were probably lots of other ones where power was equitable, um, and it wasn't, it wasn't viewed, or I, I say probably, but I just get so disgusted by these dominant themes of everyone thinking they knew how it was. We don't know how it was 10,000 years ago. We don't really know how it was a few thousand years ago. We don't, individual humans don't walk through the day with a thorough understanding of what our ancestors were like. We have ideas. Those certain themes of those ideas, like the, the male-dominant, alpha-male, powerful thing, permeate our societies. But we can propose alternative explanations that may very well have also been happening, like a matriarchal societies, for example. You know, that, that probably happened. The, the different um, roles, familial roles, the different roles of individuals within a group structure, what that looked like, what our psychology was like, what we were like before we had verbal communication, but we probably had really good nonverbal communication. It, it not only might not be like what we think, it may have been better. And so what were our global values in those situations? I don't think they were money, wealth, and power. I think that's like the silverback gorilla myth, or, or you know, that, that, the myth is that that permeates all m- mammals or animals, you know, that male, strong male, violent male dominance drives evolution or something. I don't even know. It's an example, right, <laughs> of something that happens. There's probably lots of other examples. So what would our global value systems might have looked like? In all that I have studied and read and seen and experienced and heard about, and ingested, and theorized about, and pondered, a few themes come up. And one of the big ones is this connectivity issue, right? This idea that because of physics, again, because of the consilience of all these different disciplines, one of the dominant themes is that all this stuff is connected in these systems where, you know, a butterfly flapping its wings in Africa causes a typhoon in uh, Polynesia. You know, whatever. That's a, per- that's a recurring theme. And if that were true, how does hoarding money fit into any value system that could possibly exist? Unless you have this, you know, silverback gorilla hierarchical structure that's opposite of egalitarian and and sort of, um, you know, dictatorial. Uh, is that really the way the world works? You know, I, I don't, I find it really hard to believe. And so looking at the common themes, I see values of connectivity and community and interaction and discourse as being driving for those have to, that has to be some part of this to realize that we're simultaneously the yin yang of the individual and a group, that we have dual responsibilities that has to be in there somewhere. And then secondarily, 
like I said in the last episode, it has to have something to do with love. And I use the word love not to describe sexual attraction or hand-holding or kissy-smoochy relationships, but the, to, to describe this life force that is outside the context of our five senses that aids in that connectivity. And I think, as I'll talk about in the next episode, it's probably an evolutionary artifact of the shift from asexual reproduction to sexual reproduction. I think there's a lot to get at there that uh, I'm going to dedicate a whole episode to. That love is just sort of an artifact of that, and it forms the metaphorical glue, if you will, for that connectivity. And, 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 and what love is is a feeling that comes from, you know, I almost think it's like we receive the sun's energy, right? And this sounds so pedantic, hokey pokey, woo woo, you know, mystic, mystical, sh- whatever, that it almost makes me sick. But at the same time, I can't deny it anymore. I'm coming at this from like a reluctant <laughs> acceptance sort of, sort of place. And maybe you can get there with me if you're feeling that way. It can be done. Of f- receiving that energy, because let's face it, the sun's energy drives everything that we know on Earth as far as like a fuel. And then sort of bouncing that back out into the world. You know, when I am at my best... I can feel sort of an abdominal heart somewhere in the middle of my body. I can feel the light and the energy of the light inside coming out. You know, I want to share it. I think when people say, I want to help people, you know, that's what they feel. When they say they want a girlfriend or a boyfriend, that's what they feel. When they want to connect with people, when they want to have kids, when you want to have a pet, it's like this energy is bouncing back out of me because I am alive. And I, I got to do something with it. And what we need is these connections. And I, the problems of the global values of wealth, power, and status manifest themselves in our individual human actions on a daily basis. And this is what I really wanted to say in this episode. I think globally... Individual humans, because I had this experience recently, or this, this, this epiphany of, of the experience, I think we continually, habitually are looking for those connections because our, they're ancestral, they're, they're um, epigenetic, they're so ingrained as a part of our evolution that you know, the, this, 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 what we do with this energy is driving us to have these human connections. And I think what hap- what's happening is the more and more siloed we get, the more and more individual individualized we get, the more and more we accept the pendulum swinging toward individual greed-based existences and sort of man- you know, curating our lives like we do our Instagram feed for positive reinforcement only that you know enforces these sort of s- the selfish side. We look to each other to have these meaningful, energetic interactions, these loving interactions, but we're, we don't receive, we don't feel safe. You know, the, the, the opportunity presents itself and the system breaks down because it turns out you're dealing with someone who's so turned off to that idea and so focused on their phone, you know, which is the epitome of this sort of selfish focus, um, non-communal effort that they're... Their, their capacity to throw that love at you is turned off. And so in realizing that, you know, sort of subconsciously, you don't, we, we, you know, we both retreat from one another. Whereas I think our interactions ancestrally, I like to think, were sort of the opposite. They were these sort of magnetized deals where it was an exchange of positive energy or of, 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 of the energy in the first place rather than sort of protecting it. And so when we go to have these interactions of meaning and find and fail, it drives us further and further. So we've hit a point where, you know, we're will it willfully, we're consciously and subconsciously siloing, uh, separating ourselves and, and isolating ourselves from one another uh, because this lack of um, reciprocated love I mean, I wish I had a better word. And so I think the solution is to not do that anymore. 
It's, and, and I think a lot of us do this, especially lots of us have had therapy and have had these realizations and have had sort of somatic experiences in meditation or with psychedelics or, or whatever it is. We go through the world, and I'm just learning how to do this, letting your freak flag fly, right? Letting that energy out. And if it's received, great. If it's not, you know, maybe that will change, right? And not being afraid of the the of not uh, entering into a reciprocal, you know, not letting that drive you away because we have prioritized as individuals that our global value is this, and we will do this thing, this feeling connected, whatever you want to call it, regardless of what comes back. Right, that's what love is, and that's what everybody, all the all the pros will tell you that you know love is is something that you give willingly. Uh, without expectation of getting anything back. And in a perfect world, in this utopian society, perhaps the first couple hundred thousand years of human evolution, you know, within reason, uh, once we realized uh, that we needed this, you know, that this was a selective fit condition, um, maybe we had that. Maybe this is the way it was. So, yeah, I think, I think what's broken is this connection, this loving connection uh, and why it's broken is because we have the wrong global values that are isolating rather than connecting. Um, and until we are willing to give without receiving and to sort of turn this back on, re- even though we realize that if we don't pursue wealth, status, and power, somebody else is going to take it from us and leave us less wealthy, less powerful, and, and lower status, and potentially invisible. We're going to do it anyway. And in, um, I think, Plato's Revenge, which is the last William Offal's book that I read that I got from Nate Higgins, he talks about um, frugality and fraternity. And the idea is that, and I'll leave you with this, is... We don't, it's not to want very much, but to value the connectivity of other human beings above all else. And I think we can do that. I, I, I love the idea of global values. I love the idea of um, us uh, sort of having reached a point in human evolution where we lack fitness and we need to look back at evolutionary history to see what sort of traits and values were fit before and that we can sort of learn to replace uh, fitness or, or, or we can sort of replace our values uh, toward the hopes that our global values can change, make us more fit and sort of trickle down stream to solve problems like climate crisis. Imagine a world where we didn't value money and status and power. Then what, where does, what does corporate structure do? We have no interest in it anymore. It changes a lot of if you, if you follow that path of what might change. I personally can see a way, and that would be as, an amazing thing to do to actually change those values globally. But I think it would trickle down to sort of solve the climate crisis, uh, and and that's what I'm, I'm, I'm believing and I'm sticking to it. So I'm I'm Chris Bircher. This is Knowledge Plus Experience Eagles Wisdom. This has been episode 116. Why we're broken. And I'll see you next week. Take it easy.